Um, so I'm an expert in attention, so everybody needs to pay attention. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. I, I recognize a, a few of you as I look around the room. Uh, it, this is a, a real honor to be, uh, be addressing you here over this fine lunch. So what I thought I'd talk to you about is one of the drivers of, of the advancements of medicine, and, and that is technology. And over the last two decades, I would say technology has reshaped medicine more than any other factor uh, that, that we've seen in, in certainly in my lifetime, and, and I suspect yours as well. Um, and that's particularly true in the field of ophthalmology, where there are so many uh, ways of actually looking at the, the disease within the eye that we can now use technology to uh, gain very, very fine, precise diagnosis and guide our treatments. Uh, so there are many, not all diseases of the eye are, of course, aging diseases, but many are. And so these technologies I've sort of listed as my top five. The eye would be a window into the body. We can see blood vessels, we can see nerves, we can see cells. Uh, just by looking very carefully and from that, we can extract certain information about whether or not there is a systemic disease, such as diabetes, for example. But when that window closes because of blood or tumors or a dense cataract, we have to use sound waves instead of light waves to get our images. So shown here on, on the, uh, the left-hand side is the, the world's first ultrasound exam. You'd actually sit in this apparatus. It was like a Jacques Cousteau apparatus, and you'd put your head in a, in a bowl full of water, and you'd come up in the middle, and the, the ultrasound machine would get a picture of the eye, uh, and that was shown on the right-hand side, and if this is a pointer, no, it's not. Uh, um, anyway, you can see basically the rough uh, cross-sectional shape of, of the eye over on the right-hand side. That was 1970. Let me show you today. This is an ultrasound that was taken on the spaceship, the Columbus, uh, administered by an astronaut herself, uh, and that's the kind of quality of the image over on the right, and you can see very, very exquisite detail of not only the lens, uh, but the, the little structures that are supporting the lens. And if you do, do another one that sort of looks at the front of the eye, you can see very uh, exquisite detail of the iris, etc. So ultrasound imaging has really taken off and allowed us to diagnose very small problems when we can't see in. Of course, when we can see in, uh, we have in the past relied on film-based cameras. And this would be on the left, it would be a state-of-the-art camera in 1970, uh, Zeiss, German-made, it was excellent. Uh, and, the, and a trained photographer would spend about 10, 15 minutes taking pictures in these seven different circle areas. Um, and with good focus, we'd get reasonable information um, from the back of the eye. That was the state of the optics then. Today, and recently, and just as recently as two months ago, we now have a camera that has optics that can take those seven circles plus an extra 60, 70 percent. Uh, so we're now fo photographing with one picture the entire back, the inside of a marble essentially, and it only takes a couple of seconds and it doesn't take a trained photographer. So that has really advanced our ability to capture images of things that are going on in the back of the eye, and there, there are many, many to list. Diabetes being one, macular degeneration being another, and so this has really helped us quite a bit. Now, number four in technology is we not only want to see what's back there, but we also want to see what's working. And one of the things that needs to work are the blood vessels, and so we call that angiography. This is circa 1960. This would, we had a, an apparatus like this. Over here in the left picture, I don't know if you can make it out, the fellow in the, in the dark suit is the photographer, and the guy sitting down is either a doctor or a nurse, uh, and they would be preparing uh, an intravenous injection. They would inject dye into the vein, uh, and the photographer would you know, painstakingly take these pictures over about 60 seconds, uh, and, and that would be the angiogram. And so you could see these images over there. You could see the white lines. Those are blood vessels, uh, and, and that's how we would extract whether or not the blood vessels were open, or whether they were closed, or whether there was new blood vessels working. Um, and let me give you an example of what w that would look like in, in macular degeneration. Over on the right picture, that's the macula. The macula is the center of your retina. That's the part that's 
allowing you to read your menu today at lunch and, and all the fine reading materials in Immacula. But unfortunately, the eye gets tired over many decades of use and this cell layer right here uh, forms this yellow deposit and those deposits are called drusen and that is just from being bio, uh, biochemically active for many, many years and into those yellow deposits come new blood vessels and, and that's the problem because these new blood vessels will bleed and cause separation of the retina from its normal support and that's what we're imaging over on the right side and so when we see that we need to now inject the eye with medication to reverse this whole process. So the challenge has been this angiography needs to get a little better and the technology that came to help us is this op optical coherence tomography and how many uh, retired physics professors are there in the crowd today? <laughs> Okay, I'm safe. I can make up anything and it'll probably work. <laughs> but basically, let's take a color of light like red. And if you can use, the red light is so coherent, meaning that it goes up and down like a sine wave. And, and we can manipulate that red wave just very slightly. And from that, determine the properties of how it penetrates through the retina and bounces back to the detector. Uh, and by doing that, we can separate the retina, which is only a few microns thick, into its 10 different layers. And those of you at the front might be able to appreciate the 10 different layers of the retina. Now, if you do that even more complicatedly, you can, you can do cross sections of the retina at 3,000 per second. And then you can register them all, stack them together like a photo album. And this is the kind of resolution of the blood vessels that you, can, that you can get. It's absolutely amazing. This is without dye. You can see the very tiny little uh, uh, small capillaries, the smallest blood vessels in the body um, you know, that are imaged here over here on the right. So we can detect now uh, non-invasively much quicker uh, all these problem areas in macular degeneration and diabetes, etc. So number four, OCT angiography has really, uh, and we're just at the very, at the pre precipice of that. We're going to see a lot more of that in the next five years. Number three technology, brain imaging. Now what you're seeing here is a beautiful cross-sectional picture of the brain. Um, and the reason this is so uh, applicable to ophthalmology is for this reason. This is the brain uh, sort of diagra diagrammatically presented with all of the structures that are involved in either processing vision or in moving the eyes to process some other part of the vision. So we not only have eyes that are working all the time, we also have a brain that's telling the eyes where to look. So if you combine all those centers, you're using an awful lot of the brain. And of course, all of those centers have to be connected. And so you have these white lines which represent wires, or in, in, uh, in anatomical terms we call those axons. And there, you can see a lot of them are lined up with the brain stem. So there are literally millions of them that are going up and down the brain stem. And that's important because when people get head injuries, which is one of my uh, research interests, I, I want you to show this, uh, I want you to watch this image of, uh, of uh, Sidney Crosby, and this was his first concussion. They were playing one of these outdoor games, I uh, forget the team they were playing against. And see if you can see what the mechanism of the concussion is. We used to think that it was just a direct impact on the head straight on, but watch this video and see if you can see differently. Here he comes, he's turning around watching the play. <laughs> And you'll see one more time. I apologize for the gruesomeness of that, but it, it really is a, a violent sport. Uh, here it is again. You can see him again. You appreciate that sudden impart of rotational acceleration. And that's what's happening to all of those millions of wires that are going down the brainstem. And so we have now imaging that can actually allow us to see those wires called diffusion tensor, tensor imaging. And that's what you're looking at right there. All those beautiful colors are all different wires that are all going down from the brain down through the brainstem. And when you get that sudden uh, force, that rotational acceleration, it's like wringing a towel of those wires and crushing those, those wires or those axons, and that's where the problems lie. So 
Um, there's a lot of research that is now coming out that's going to tell us about concussion, tell us about brain injury, and, and that will, will help us uh, going forward. So that's, that's uh, technology number three that's really uh, changing our world. Number two, tele-ophthalmology. That's just basically, tele means at a distance, so we're trying to learn how to do ophthalmology at a distance. Canada is a vast country. We can't have specialists everywhere uh, in our geography. So we have to learn how to have specialist centers like Kingston and still be able to provide service in places like James Bay, Moose Factory, um, or even further abroad in Africa. And here are just two examples. In the upper right, you can see that this is a, a standard iPhone with now a, an app. Uh, with a little attachment that actually photographs the back of the eye and that can be sent over the internet so to an observer that can be millions of miles away. The second was a, a very exciting process. This is a regular slit lamp but it's been adapted so that the internet can now control where it's looking just as if the observer was sitting right behind it but the camera will then take the pictures and this is what you'd see on your desktop com computer. So I could potentially examine a patient right from my laptop computer which is sitting here in front of me. So we're actually um, collaborating with the University of Miami right now. We're hoping to have one of these units uh, this year and we'll be using it uh, actually in Moose Factory uh, which is on the, uh, the south part of uh, James Bay. So we'll be stationed in Kingston but examining patients in, in Moose Factory. So that's pretty exciting. And then technology number one has to be lasers. Lasers have been with us for uh, quite a while now, but we, in ophthalmology, uh, because we can really uh, see into all layers of the eye, uh, lasers have been great for us because they've allowed us to treat so many different things. Starting with the upper right, that is sort of a patterned laser now. We used to painstakingly put in 2,000 little laser burns for a diabetic. Now we can do it sort of 200 burns at a time uh, and we can position it very in a very controlled fashion and that, are, that allows us to control the negative parts of, of diabetes. Um, the, the next one here, this is, this is an, a little movie that actually shows what a cataract is. You can see the light coming in. When it gets cloudy, it causes the light to, to bounce all over and then that degrades vision of course. So you might have heard of laser-assisted uh, cataract surgery, and basically what it does is parts of the operation are now it's uh, performed by a laser, um, and we're still figuring this technology out. I'd, I wouldn't say we're we're quite there there yet, because the conventional surgery uh, is is so good that uh, for the laser surgery to be better uh, is quite a tall task. So anyway, this is what the laser looks like. It kind of does a checkerboard thing. It softens up the nucleus, and then we put the instruments in. You'll see the next step here. We, we, take, we peel away the outside layer, and we use another instrument to, uh, this is the conventional over here on the left, and that's the laser on the right. And, and you can see in this cartoon that it, it looks easier to remove the, the cataract with the laser-assisted surgery, and that's, that's what the purported advantage is. But I would say that, again, <coughs> our current surgery is so good that we have a ways to go to actually make, uh, make definite scientific evidence that the laser is better. We're not quite there yet. And then sometimes after you have the lens implant in already, you form what's called a secondary cataract, and another laser can be used for that, and that's called a YAG laser. And this is just a quick uh, a video that shows you what that's like. You can see the whitening in behind the implant and the eye will turn in a second. There you go. And then we just use the laser and uh, we basically cause a little cut to go in the back. Uh, we go it up and down and back and forth and, and then it opens up magically and, and it's just like you had the cataract surgery yesterday. So all of these technologies have really allowed us to, uh, to intervene uh, and restore vision in the eye in a very exciting way. Uh, it's a great time to be an ophthalmologist and it's a great time to help people. Um, and I thank you for your attention. I'll take a couple questions.